Hello everyone, today we talk about the evangelization of Europe during early medieval times, also you know, late antiquity, uh, and more in general to address a you know a, a context background for things that we will discuss at some point, hopefully, um, in the future in other videos regarding the transition from the pagan to Christian military culture, right? And we already actually made some video about the topic, but it's important to stress, you know, what spheres uh, this conversion was was to touch, you know, how the thing fundamentally happened, right? And we have already outlined the the gradually, like the even the, the slow uh, process of, of the world thing, and also the uh, syncretic results, the syncretic outcome of the same Today we address this to show fundamentally how, aside from a strictly military point of view, that once again we will address at some point, um, other aspects of politics and society were involved in this regard. You know that because of the clause of its in Trinity, you can't properly understand nor politics, nor society, nor war if you lack an understanding of even just one of the three, right? And this is one big deal generally speaking, in our own society that lacks overwhelmingly, not just, you know, sometimes the basics of all three of them, but especially neglects the military side of the story in its actually, mm, you know, conceptual aspects, you know, properly in the theory of the art of war. But looking at the history of these peoples is fundamental to uh, understand how the process of Christianization was matched by... Uh, Actually, in a positive sense, by the same uh, the same elites mostly that naturally had big interests in Christianizing themselves and their the population, right? How the the process was needed by the same Christians, not for you know uh, much of a direct, overwhelming total control in the societies, but actually to to spread further uh, the system and gaining benefits in terms of even just you know socio economical way. Right, political stability, first of all, actually, pacification, right, so it's actually a big process that we could, you know, just to put a, a time frame to it, we could start talking about the migration era to fundamentally the 11th century, uh, and it's a process that not even at the end of this time was, was actually complete, right, you can argue it was never completed uh, cent for cent, but it, it was at the same time, uh, you know, developing alongside with civilization as well. Um, so the point we're making is that war naturally constituted just one of the many points in uh, in order to which the Christian doctrine was say destined to a dramatic confrontation with the Germanic traditions. Right here it could include naturally the Slavs, uh, the Celts, other, you know, all, all those societies that had remained you know, in part or completely uh, pagan, but beginning beginning of this period, we're just starting to enter in contact with Christianity and already spotting the benefits of it. You know, these populations in Europe had um, uh, fundamentally received what the Roman Empire had been about, had received the divine uh, principle o over which it was based, right? We have seen countless times how here it's not even important to to actually uh, isolate just the, the idea of Christianity paganism, but properly the the idea of the divine uh, that didn't change. Uh, first of all, not all of a sudden with Christianity, but in in, in practice it didn't it didn't change at all by by others, right? You know the Germans that were dealing with the Roman Empire, the, 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 you know what they cared really about uh, when when addressing the empire, when confronting with the empire, was realizing that it doesn't matter if the, the, the Roman Empire was pagan or Christian, but just the fact that it was an empire that of, of ecumenic scale, that evidently the deity, whichever it was, had given to the, the power, the right, to rule on earth. Right? This is the, as we've seen, the sole uh, reason for legitimizing power in the ancient and even in the medieval world, and don't think that this was true, you know, wasn't true up to a few centuries ago, right? What, what's the, the moral, uh, juridical, let's say, uh, justification of an empire? It's exclusively military and religious. That is to say, 
the, the power you have, the imperium you have proper, and this thing is not human. It's being given by the gods. So, in, independently from the forms that, as we will see now, would become very important in the process of evangelization, actually, the, the reasons that connected these peoples to, to Christianity, to the empire, to the imperial order, were of mostly a political and social scale, was realizing, look, we can be part of the system, we can share part of their power, just as these populations enjoyed you know, the, the benefits of Roman civilization, they essentially moved in to, not to destroy, but to properly get that, or make it work, right? And the thing transforms the process naturally, but there is a, a deep Romano-Germanic syncretism, which is at the base of, uh, you know, most of Western civilization, I would say. The same goes could be easily said for, for the Slavs, or you could say for the for the broader, um, let's say, sedentary or semi-nomadic, not fully nomadic elements, uh, at least in a, in a strictly uh, m m secular sense, we could say, you know, of course, the steppes culture, you know, this had an overwhelming impact, right? We have seen how the history of, of chivalry is fundamentally of, of Iranian derivation, right? Uh, in, in, in the West, this this went on, of course, in many other cultures, but, you know, the even the same idea of the night was dramatically revived uh, in Europe that had never forgotten, even in the most sedentarized times of, you know, the Iron Age, etc., the fact that there was actually a few cavalry in Europe in the first place, that those deities, right, of the Caucasian past were fundamentally deities of war, mounted deities. Right, these are these tremendous visions that these people would would actually have on the battlefields of these uh, gods riding alongside them and and uh, delivering death and destruction upon the enemies and justifying the process of how the system was constructed. Right, but we can say that at least the nomadic populations at some point remained out of this thing, you know, for for a long time. Right, you know, as far as Russia, you know, at the end of the Middle Ages, beginning of the Renaissance, you know, that that was a Wherever there was a sedentarization, this had fundamentally spread from the uh, from the the Christian models, from even from the process of Romanization proper. Because whatever you want to see it like, whether you you were converted by the Roman papacy or the Constantinopolitan um, orthodoxy, that was Rome, and that was Christian, right? So it went in either place. But you know, this stuff eventually were taken over even by the West. Uh, this is a wholly another chapter. I want I didn't want to exclude that cultural track, that cultural channel, but still we're talking here of a process that took very concrete form, right? The, the ecclesiastical organization in this regard was one of the very few bases upon which um, some of these cultures of Central and Northern Europe could, for the first time, actually give up a stable, definite um, stabilization to their own power, right? The, we have seen countless times how Naturally, the process of Christianization went in parallel with one of creation of monarchies and states, because that's at the end of the day what what is needed, and, and this should be, um, I mean, should be really meditated by all those who think that this was actually a negative process, as if you know, paganism was the 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 carrier of who knows which uh, you know higher um, value or more. It, it, it was wiped out fundamentally in in the or original political and social forms. Right, maybe not culturally, but that's still a, a you know kind of a, a minority aspect of it. That uh, actually Christianity uh, brought uh, with itself since the beginning. Right, read the Bible, read all the of course the pagan relics that there isn't there. Read of how this naturally even the Romans were Christianized. So the, the populations of the empire had actually received uh, the the evangelic word, and, and we will take a look at this more uh, directly, but let's say that, uh, you know, there is no doubt that civilization, the creation of what we call modern and advanced and developed passed through the crashing of that system. It was just a tribal one, right? And it was naturally contextual to a reality. Today we will see, in fact, you know, how, you know, much it resisted to the, um, to, to the strand, not because they had something in particular against uh, the other model, right? This is an oppositional view that I don't know how healthy it is in a in 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 the modern uh, historical and unavoidably political discourse because this 
you know, much of the extremism we see in politics from, from either side is actually uh, still revolving around things of how, you know, the process of Christianization actually was beneficial or detrimental to some civilization. I have a, a very specific idea in this regard that I, I do not enforce because in this case I, you know, am biased in favor of Christianity. I, I, that might have happened in other ways. Right, you know the the way we should look at the historical process in terms of saying, look that it's a freaking miracle that things happened the way they did, like because they could have gone in very different ways. It turned out it happened through that. So you have to give a as much as you can a rational explanation. Generally speaking, from a historical point of view, models that are discarded, outdated are generally speaking the ones that do not work. Right. So I I, I challenge you to 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 show me that, I don't know, 6th century Europe was better than 16th century Europe, right? In the medieval millennium, the, the improvement in terms of civilization uh, of, 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 of Europe was, was dramatic, was utterly dramatic. There is no comparison, right? Let's leave aside, of course, the silliest prejudices about the thing, the idea that the ancient world was more advanced than the Middle Ages, which, of course, is not true. But let's be honest about the sheer. You think about Scandinavia. Think about 6th century Scandinavia and look at the, the, the Scandinavian kingdoms in 16th century. Right, of course, we're still somewhat behind compared to, 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 the, to the rest. You know, where the thing gets started from. But, I mean, they actually improved even more in, in relative terms than, say, southern Europe at that point during the medieval millennium. And even here, there are lots of reasons. And... Um, it's, however, undeniable, in my opinion, that this achievement took place, right? And this is, once again, it's not just because of Christianity. Christianity is just an indicator. Uh, it brings, actually, on the table very interesting uh, points from, especially, a matter of conscience, hence of responsibility and of individual, um, you know, commitment that, in other realities, in, especially in the contractual ones, are, do not exist simply as that. So they of course correspond to, to a more advanced system that came to happen because of course lots of other things came to happen but that fundamentally cannot be attributed to the previous existing model. So this is just my my point and I know that many people are completely deaf to any of these uh, arguments because they, they refuse the phobically to even discuss the issue sometimes. But it, it's actually, you know, the, the macroscopical pattern that we managed to trace historiographically speaking in, in you know in, in 2000 years of in fact of civilization and more actually and uh, you know in order to, to challenge it you should put something on the table that is not just to say you know uh, I don't know the, the pagan world was freer and happier and you know it was what we should revert to because ju just an as and nine uh, uh, prejudice about you know thinking that uh, a society were dramatically unstable politically speaking extremely violent that weren't free at all telling the truth because the reason why you see all that alleged freedom is just a mechanistic contractual necessity of a world that actually ostracized in, in the best of cases all those people who exited from their pre predetermined roles uh, look at what did happen to women if they just tried to exceed drone in the swamps, right, um, that uh, was dramatically poor at a point, right, you know, wh whatever you don't find that stability, and let's leave aside the, the most obvious environmental realities of northern and eastern Europe um, in terms of climate, terrain, and, and all this stuff, but, you know, let, let's realize that, uh, you know, that, that's something you see in many other parts of the world. In this sense, there is nothing specifically peculiar to this cultures that um, over exceeds all the other aspects like we know what tribal societies are throughout all the history of mankind this did not make exception the fact that in the west we kind of concentrated mostly on the romano-germanic dichotomy it's in fact a western thing but this thing happened all over the world essentially other ways and we know how those societies work we know that they are nightmarish realities and we have even you know a pretty good idea of what you know, something that even is in between, between us and, and those rallies actually was to tell us more about what it was even before that, right? And even this is no mystery, right? We have demonstrated it once again 
historically. It, it, and it's not me telling you, you know, just try to, to read how any book that is written today about these issues proves that, right? Not tells the tale of, which is what most people think now history is about telling a tale. No, history is making a research, which is a very different thing. And true history is checking that, verifying what is written. And naturally, modern historiography is very sophisticated. Uh, then I'll give you that there are some uh, takes on these issues also that are starting to happen historiographically speaking that, that actually elude from the, completely from this problem. Like this is a moderate problem or people make it even more radical uh, in many ways and that do it for even at political reasons. So the fact that tribal societies were primitive, violent, etc. has nothing to do, for example, with the intrinsicality of their evil. Right. Uh, we know that humans do that for specific reasons that we can't explain biologically, anthropologically, politically, socially, and, and everything else, uh, you know, contributes to, to form this coherent picture that we know about humanity. So I realized that in the world things are going straight at so many levels uh, for for the imminent crisis that we are going through from a, from a macroscopical even way, we look at just that economy uh, in general, but compared to, to a few a few decades ago, but, you know, um, think even about the the reasons that, I mean, how the the attitude towards history is changing just in a, in a poli toward, towards a political uh, direction, right? Always think that history is always political in, in a way or in another, because even, you know, whatever you say has an impact on the world, and that, that is enough to be political. The problem is that, you know, before people tended to say, okay, well, but let, let's try, in order to be taken seriously, let's try to be, to avoid to be political as much as possible, at least to, to give the impression of doing that. We are losing that, and that's dangerous. Albeit, you know, I think the academic standards are still good enough in this regard. And I always make this premise, because when I talk about these topics, I know that lots of people are going to watch these videos and simply saying, oh, let's see this guy from which side he is. Is he an alt-right or is he a leftist, right? It, that's not the dichotomy you address history like, right? It's not about me, it's not about maybe this is not about, but I, I realize that we are getting disabituated to that because objectively most of the people have those kind of agendas. I try to be as unbiased as I can and at, at least providing some events for, for the claims I make, uh, you know, you know, I, you know that I never use my titles, I never pretend that I'm somewhat superior to, to anybody with this, that is listening. But of course, I pretend that at least if I, I'm talking about something that people can't go check whether you know what what I say is true, and if it's just taking my opinion like a, a matter of uh, because I, I I studied a bit of this stuff, right? So I, I can't put every single thing in in note or in quote, um, but I can even leave you something to to read. But the point is that don't think this is my personal opinion uh, in a in a meta-historical sense, right? This is, a, I'm trying to make a historical point here, right? And this is how you should always address the channel because otherwise I wouldn't do this. Like, otherwise I wouldn't care. I could even stop tomorrow. I don't care after all. I don't care about the views. I don't care about, I don't do this for money. I don't do this for any apparently practical utility. I just do it because I like to discuss history, which is what, generally speaking, a historian should be about. Uh, and generally speaking, I think everybody should be about. Um, so, dealing with this actually very heavy topic, right, because the evangelization of Europe was brutal, right, I, and I can't say, uh, we've explained this a lot of time, it, it's not a brutality in the sense of, you know, that most of it actually passed through violence, actually most of the evangelization of Europe was absolutely non-violent, right, most of the, the people were, uh, let's say, more distant from, from that mindset that by the end of the Roman Empire had actually encompassed the, the majority of Europeans, because the majority of people had lived in, in the former lands in Europe, in the former lands of the Roman Empire, um, and um, but also those who were more distant actually came to accept these realities largely autonomously, right? Then if, if someone was put to death here and there, but we don't have, you know, uh, in, in terms of uh, self-Christianization, a, a genocidal reality. Right, genocidal reality, I don't like the term for the Middle Ages, but you can look at the Baltic Crusades, and yeah, that, that was enforced violently, and actually, 
Crusaders didn't give a damn who was Christian or Pag in many cases. It was just most obviously a political reason, as most actually religious things are as well. But if you look at the Christianization in Scandinavia, yes, of course, some king at some point enforced something, killing, uh, you know, uh, or throwing, confiscating, and all this stuff. But generally speaking, the majority, we know this from the sides, you know, began to, to Christianize themselves. They were aware of Christianity, they knew what it was about. And especially a point that is very rarely made is that paganism is most obviously not uh, uh, an oppos uh, something oppositional to theism as such. Right, to a pagan, every god is theoretically welcome as long as it proves to be worth all. And naturally, the Christian message uh, includes something much more exclusive and, let's say, if you want, even intolerant, of course, right, and we will be seeing it today, but at the same time presents an alternative that is to say, you, you know, why is that that what you're doing uh, as a, essentially as a political social regulation in terms of pagan ritual, because that was really what the thing was, like paganism wasn't really a matter of belief, right, it was a, a way to regulate society, just like Christianity was, but in a much, in a concretual way, then even in their beliefs varied dramatically, there was no homogeneity in this world either, there was a problem for the same Christianization as we will see, because they, the, the, the missionaries didn't quite know how to address every single thing they found. It wasn't a you know uh, an heterogeneous pattern of, of, of paganism in that in that sense, um, and uh, look at LG Saga for example. That's a beautiful thing. I even made a video about that. I think it's the the sinker. I don't remember the evangelization of the North Synchrosis, something like that. It's a video that speaks of that, where we find a, a, a complete uh, independent, like spontaneous Christianization actually against paganism because it said this thing doesn't work. To what I feel the need to, right, and and there is a specific reason why the system didn't work anymore. That was, incidentally, like if you read Elgin's saga, a dramatic one. That is to say, this guy who had worshipped his own deity for entire for a lifetime is wiped out by other, by another group, violently, and and the guy says, you know, my deity didn't help me at all, so he embraced Christianity in a military sense to crush these guys, to say, look at these fools that still believe in this stuff, and I managed to crush them, and I, and because I began to believe in something that goes objectively a bit more beyond, here we, we can't make it a tree of anthropology or history or religion, I will not explain in this video why, according to me, of course, not just to me, actually, theism does correspond to a, a, a way more sophisticated way of thinking that is, as we were saying before, dramatically connected with the concept of response, moral responsibility, right? You know, the, the, it, it's strange how everything is not put in perspective. You know, that those people maybe try to to make it an identitarist uh, matter to say, you know, if those people truly believed in the thing that today there is just moral relativism. It's actually moral relativism to think that paganism w was fine and or uh, at the same level of Christianity. And Christianity, let's be honest about this, didn't care actually much about paganism as long as it didn't bind people from a political or social point of view. The Christianization of the countryside was naturally incomplete. And what did the church give about it? Of course nothing. Because what can a peasant do? Can a peasant invent, you know, uh, you know, an alternative intellectual system to, 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 a, to a monotheism and to challenge it? Of course not. Problems began were mostly about, you know, the same Christianity, but in something about heresies and so on. But most, more specifically, about systems that were trying to, to, to become more structured, it, that in parallel had began, began to develop already a tendentially monotheistic tendency. Think about enotheism in the same Roman Empire. The paganism of Julian was a, you know, a, an Apollinian um, enotheism, but if Caesar had looked at that, would have felt disgusted about it. As much as you know what Caesar believed, it would have seemed disgusting to to Fortis Camillus, just to, to make an example. But uh, that's how the history of even of, of 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 intellect of thought evolves, right? And once again, we can't explain it here, but it, it's a point we must be aware of. And much of this does we, we speak of this in, in a military sense because it does pass through elementary uh, achievements like pacifying a society. A tribal society is not pacific. 
because for the mere fact that it exists, it means that it hasn't had better means to, to regulate it itself but those ones. And these were dramatically unfair, unequal societies as well. There was no egalitarianism in these realities. Egalitarianism worked exclusively for the oligarchs. The rest of the people were also in this place, of course, working for these, these others. And there were bitter discriminations, fierce oppressions, uh, and no mean to enforce a broader justice as it would emerge from more structured realities. That took over everywhere. Right? It's, it's not that there's been a place in the, the history of civilization in these lands that were, you know, the system remained. It remained just at the outskirts of Europe and the most of uh, the poorest, less, less stratified societies that incidentally were not definitely a good place, to, good places to live in by later standards, right? So we can't put this into, uh, you know, Christianity brought the end of, of, of our identity, of our rea- it, it's, it, it's silly, it doesn't even make sense. First of all, it's, it's not true by definition, I would say. It, it doesn't even take to, to, to make a socio-economical qualitative, you know, realization of how that improvement materially took place. It's just that it, paganism properly didn't conceive that because it, for, for it, the, there was no, no point of it, right? Uh, th- there was naturally a tendency, like in all the other societies, to improve the situation and that improvement passed through the same way that those societies be- began to be more oligarchic and eventually monarchic and finding ever more ways and means of legitimization to enforce its own power o- on all the rest of society. This can be debatable, Right, and even if it's controversial, things did improve. So I don't personally see it just as a matter of, you know, a mere imposition from the above. It's actually the, the rest of society who said, you know what, you know, rather than keeping to leaving this mess, I w- I would try to to give a bit of you know power t- to this person, and okay, maybe I will lose part of my own, but at least I will not end butchered or my my wife and children raped and chopped to pieces, right? As it normally happened, in pretty much. I don't want to make it too dramatic, but don't think that this is just uh, hyperbolic, right? And we we know it, factually speaking, because this society told this to us, right? And and it's all about violence. It's all about realizing, of course, uh, war as a as an instrument of policy and realizing why it is used, which is never for a merely brutal reason. It's always for a logic that we are trying to to overshadow today because we say, you know, violence is not human or this is nonsense, right? Violence is human as much as belongs to the, the animal world. War is probably possibly the single most human thing that exists um, in terms of, you know, collective activity. Uh, there is else in this regard, but uh, I mean, maybe not a collective activity compared to politics, for example, but it's properly, in fact, a political act and it's quite distinctive of, of the human race. But aside from this, let's keep on track. Uh, so we, we could say, as we were saying before, that th- this Christianization was full of gaps, it was unsatisfactory, superficial in most of the cases. Indeed it was. Right? Do you think that you know, the, the Roman Empire became Christian, uh, the Roman Germanic kingdoms became Christians. I do think people were Christian. They actually understood theology. Uh, even those th- that actually were. Because let's also get rid of another myth that, you know, a pagan couldn't be proud to be a Christian too. As we were saying, for a pagan mindset, that's perfectly compatible. What it's incompatible for is for a, you know, f- a fully aware Christian mentality, right? Or someone at least has that has the need or the interest or the or the necessity of, of enforcing that exclusivity, right? So as we we're seeing, actually, the majority of the people, we know it quite easily. Look at some of the most immediately Catholic Romano-Germanic kingdoms, the one of the Franks. But this, that was one of the, 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 the slightest, most superficially Christianized of all. Because the rest of the people, it was a matter of elites, right? Of Germanic and Romano, uh, Roman Gallic elites together ruling this real. The rest of the peasantry, what the hell cared what they thought? Did they have any power in the first place? No. So what did hell care? And even if you know a, a Germanic count still believed in uh, 
back and you know human sacrifice we actually have evidence of this stuff but even by the seventh century you know what it's you know as long as that is used maybe ex against external enemies and for the sake of local society of the local uh, romano germanic politics and population you know it's it, it's still working you know in some way what's the problem exactly right we know that the think about the carolingian reform of the clergy these people even barely know how to speak latin they couldn't read the bible it's easy as that they they, they couldn't translate latin they invented some of the worst things uh, you know but, but you know they, they didn't have an ideological base but i can say they could have turned into heresies in this regard but we're talking about you know, the Christian clergy that couldn't even read the Bible or understand what was written in it. And this was somewhat normal. And it tells you how much it takes to to make these people aware, after all, a, a, a long time. And how few, the, the you know, the reality had changed for them in practice. Because at the end of the day, this is the point. As we were saying before, that's the measure of how non-violent, largely, this conversion was. Right? Um, and it's very interesting because, well, we may address it later, but it's obvious that if it becomes a, cr a clash of the elites, it becomes like the, uh, the, the tougher, you know, the, the stronger noblemen of the area wants to enforce Christianity on the rest so that they can found churches, make it all patrimonial policies about it, increase its uh, prestige and so on. There's always a, an op always a political opposition, and that will, of course, embrace paganism as a, as a, as a banner because we'll say, no, that model doesn't work, but it's obviously a political thing. And of course, as, as long as the pagan guy becomes more powerful, that switches to Christianity because that's how it's profitable as hell, right? And 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 to to, to centralize, to, to create an ecclesiastical, as we've seen, administration, to territorialize power. And this is how it happens. And we don't find exceptions to this trend, Right, the average people could think like in those terms, but average people was counting ever less, even in pagan societies, over time, to actually form a, a concrete opposition. And it was naturally a resistance, or as we were saying, but it was mostly for political reasons. Right, the, what these people uh, would eventually believe, and this is what, after all, Christianity suggests. I mean, the Jude Judeo-Christian tradition is, um, if you want to open in this regard, I mean, how many Muslims did believe in Constantinople? A lot, and we actually know that, right? And did anybody care? Of course not. There were merchants; they traded, made money, right? Well, it's plenty of realities where this intolerance didn't exist in the way we imagine it, right? It was not modern. There was not modern tolerance. It was just a balance between interests. But the idea that you can actually believe something and then, you know, uh, accept that the reality out there is different. Uh, is a typically monotheistic belief, right? It it it, it's, it splits this, uh, for example, thought and action, right? Which is not a hypocritical way, but it's actually properly the idea that it's not that what you do just by making an offer to a god is what was needed to just feel safe about it, right? It's what you choose to do as an individual that makes the difference in this world, and that God will judge you by. That's an enormous step forward, in just intellectually speaking. And it doesn't emerge from a reality that is unbearably disastrous. Like, if you look at the art of those peoples, you know, if, if you look at the art of the settlement of Germanic populations in the Mediterranean, it, 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 in the first generations, you look at this art, the Longbird art, for example, you know, it was, a, you know, psychoanalytically, it was something traumatizing. I mean, these people believed in, in a world was completely dark and screwed with a dramatic fate of, you know, universal serpents that, you know, that, that, that devoured people, that threw their, you know, chunks of, of, of bodies around. You know, it, it was torn apart. You know, it was an extremely violent reality. And it, there is no way to, 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 to pretend it was otherwise. We know, by, we know it by how these people lived. The level of militarization, the level of, you know, just of material wealth. We, they couldn't do otherwise. That's the context we need to realize. It's not judging them to say these people were stupid, were backwards because they were stupid and then so on. No. They actually performed dramatically well for for that context. Just they settle in a richer land, they, they see how, you know, broader organization works and the benefits of it. They start saying, you know what, maybe I will gradually 
start doing something similar. And this is what happened in practice. So, um, after the times of the uh, Mediterranean Christianization, right, I in a urban world that was already educated, right, it was marked by the imperial koine, it was homogeneous, uh, you know, even, you know, receptive towards the, the core Christian values at some point. There was something about the, you know, the, the Hellenistic philosophies that had already poured in, for, for which the same Christianity had been fed up by, uh, from Hel Hellenistic Judaism, you know, there, there was, weren't, uh, you know, extremely, there were radically different concepts, but they, they were at least more graspable by these people. And the problem, let's say, of, uh, of spreading Christianity further was when the, 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 the Christianization took place in, in the rural, let's say, uh, wild, uncultivated world, right? And uncultivated, of course, not in an absolute sense, right? But definitely, however, for the Hellenic Roman parameters of culture, right? As we were saying before, properly, uh, the, 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 the philosophical ensemble and uh, literacy, Literacy. Monotheism are literate religions. Do you wonder why there are people that are literate and others that are not? And what's the discriminant in there? That's all what, what brought, and that's why the, the pagan world wasn't just a matter, it wasn't a matter of, of re resistance, for which it, it, it took time to, to, to spread its values in. It's just that properly there was even no particular reason, no particular fertile ground or, or advantage to, to make it spread in them. Which were the, 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 elite, the, the, the ones who were Christian, the, the elites mostly. Because as we were saying before, that was about in integrating them in a system that could be useful in ways that could be beneficial for, for both of the sides. Right? This is the main deal. Why would they do that for? Do you think that, you know, was some, uh, you know, zealous Christian wanted to out, go out there and convert everybody and for, for, you know, for, for some reason and power that, you know, that would derive immediately to him that, you know, that had the means and the push? Of course there were, like there were many other realities, but how do you think they actually counted in, in terms of strictly religious push, uh, for for the Christianization of these people. Christianization of Europe passed essentially through political means. Right? Political and social. And sometimes military as well, of course. But the the religious problem here is in, in part is overlooked, but also in, in this other perspective, as you understand, is overly you know, is overrated or better it, it it's often portrayed in misleading terms. Right, and this is a a problem of ours as modern people. Right, these people here didn't care about it at least in the way we do. Right, it was obviously much more important than uh, to to us today, where religion doesn't play much of a a political and social role in proportion in relative terms to what it used to do. But it, it, it's obvious that at the time the the were very different and practical reasons, especially from a, for a pagan, actually, but for Christians it was basically the same, uh, to either accept or not accept this, right? And, and this is not to say that the religious aspect, of course, didn't count. Of course, it did a lot, right? Um, the, the Christian missionaries, as we were saying before, were uh, puzzled by finding a uh, an heterogeneous language in the pagan world to, to cope with, right? This was very disorienting because you basically had to reinvent a model um, every time in some way, or at least you had to take the, 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 the specific situation in, in very different ter terms depending on, on whatever the, the ba local balance actually was about. Uh, the uh, hierarchical and often collective character of certain conversions, right? Um, 
rendered very complicated the catechesis, for example. Uh, there were, for example, many baptized people, but a few true Christians. And once again, this would remain a reality for most of, you can't even say, you know, depending on the standard, many people could tell you that actually nobody was uh, really Christian, that everybody really in the world has ever had a a, a different idea of what the, the world think was at the same time, right? That formalism is what brings these people together, and this is what baptism was enforced for, because it was just a, a form. Then we know that these people didn't understand that, or they understood it in different terms, right? But what is, like, uh, uh, you know, the book you can find, historically speaking, Bible included, o over which people have unanimously agreed on, right? But there is not, and there will never be, and this is the challenge that actually Christianity also perfectly understands in the deeper roots of its philosophical wisdom, right? That it, that this is what all what about conscience is at the end of the day, um, and we don't have to, to to forget in this regard that even the same Christian missionaries that in the early Middle Ages were were going out there trying to to enforce their rights came from realities that were pagan up up to a few centuries before. And how do you, how hard do you think the the true absorb how strong the the true absorption of those principles ha had shifted actually the even the Christian practice from the pagan one, right? But this is another big deal. Where of course the elites, the, the most educated scholars of the Christian world, the fathers of the church itself, of course they were perfectly aware of that. And they, it, we know, because they denounced the problem. So you can't even deny it. this is this was a problem, because the same Christians were, uh, the Christian elites were, were lamenting that, right, in a way. And even in there we should be able to understand how this happened. I made a video last year that was about um, Santiquitius and Gregory the Great, Get, look at that, because if you really want to see how clever just a, a pope that was, not just a pope, was actually had been a magistrate, a lawyer, was a nobleman, some of the most educated families in 6th century Rome, uh, managed to, to help, you know, creating properly an agrarian Christianity, starting to put the, you know, the, the milestones, all it, uh, Exactly understanding the psychology, even of paganism, and even of the realities that exist in that in that world, and you can understand in there the intelligence of a civilization, right? And and a strategy that paid, was enforced violently, that was accepted by those same people out there. So the pagans are monsters; they don't understand anything. That are that are the same people you had been raised among. You are possibly. A bit pagan. We are. We all are still pagan. You know how superstitious are you? How can you say that you have fully rational beliefs that you don't believe in? Uh, you know, schematic aspects of reality. We all do in a way or another. Right? It's perfectly normal. And even in there, doesn't mean actually. You know, it was a, a very elaborate, sophisticated paganism in many ways. That, in fact, came pretty close eventually to what theism was was essentially bringing on for. That was also based in some ways mostly on. on some of the most sophisticated, uh, you know, Hellenistic Oriental philosophies that were coming, in fact, from developed civilization, right? Here, I promise we'll have to make a lot of uh, history of religion video because I I understand that coming out coming up with these things uh, all of a sudden may sound strange, may sound I'm I'm preaching something, but you know we we have an idea of how these movements went. Right, philologically, um, prosopographically, we, we have uh, from the history of literature. It's not it's not a religious point. It's actually historical. Right, we we know how the thing went on. Um, so um, it it was relatively easy, as we were saying before, to make a new god accepted for a pagan. Actually, very easy. More hard rose, it, it was why um, such accept, uh, acceptation should imply the abandonment of the other gods. Right? And that's where many Christian missionaries actually gave up 
right? They, they work counter to the formality of it. And that's where we can't imagine just a brutal, a massive brutal conversion of all the peoples in Europe to Christianity. Because that never happened. So, it was even that many conversions, if not most of them, were too hasty. Right? The oligarchs, the aristocracy, were, were moved by political interest or ambition to be at the same level of, of the cultured Romans, right? professing their own religion. This is in a nutshell, for example, why the Germans converted to Arianism. We'll have to make a, a hefty video about Ulfila and all the work in there of civilization made to, to make even understand the Germans what what what's the point of Christianity with their own language in Gothic, you know, trying to stress the parallelism. It was all a military aspect because of course the societies were all militarized and did you know in, in Christianity we made a video on Saint Paul and the militia Christi that um explains a bit that that that's most mostly in relation naturally to the to the Roman military rather than uh, the the barbarian ones, but uh, it, there was naturally Ulfila being the actually the most brilliant example of it. But properly for the Germans, there were many other uh, even after the Carolingian conquest of Saxony. There's all the literature about how to make these people understand what the message meant, right? And and there were necessarily compromises to do because you couldn't change the mindset of, from a day to another of a society that didn't change from a, from a day to an hour, right? Um, uh, the same goes, in the, the matter of the elites is very important. In all Romano-Germanic Europe, that's what you find, right? Think about the gods of Theodoric that were basically shared the government of Italy together with the Roman Senate that could see, you know, it was in parallel to the uh, Germanic Council of Ravenna, which together with the uh, with the with Theodoric could participate the same Romans. The Germans were about the military, the Romans about the administration of, uh, and uh, the, the there was a saying that says you know the the first of 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 the gods is a Roman and the last of the Roman is a German, right? The, the thinking that essentially the senatorial wealth and prestige and power and land owning talking about quite extensive amount of wealth was naturally what you know a, a, a gothic shift and of course wanted to achieve because what would they march into the more fertile and populated lands of the world into at that time if you look at the migrations of peoples historically speaking of all these movements it, what was their point they wanted to go on vacation in you know in an Italian resort, of course they wanted to find fresh pastures, agriculture, so that they couldn't starve to death or being obliged to attack their neighbors in order to, to survive, because that was, in a nutshell, what that world was, right? It was not so entirely dramatic, of course, by the, the late um, uh, antiquity period. Of course, the Germany of 500 AD wasn't the same one of uh, 1 AD, right? You know, there was a process of, you know, of structuring, of, of construction of something, but there was still no comparison. And of course, where did the Romano-Germanic kingdoms emerge? As the more powerful, the more structured, of course, in the, in the former lands of the Roman Empire. They had all the administration there, they had this, you know, bureaucratically skilled and educated personnel. German kings start legislating in Latin. That's the history of, of Europe. Um, and uh, conversely, the average Germanic freeman sank in this process so much that it came to be similar, after all, to those Roman subjects that, under the Germanic domination, namely, just namely, were not even fully free, right? But it practically came to be that at the same time. Uh, and on this, we actually this made some some videos about the. Romano Germanic kingdoms, how they, there are actually different dichotomies in here. It's obvious that we talk about Gothic Italy, but if you look at uh, Merovingian France, for example, well, in that it's pretty evident that it was a, a perfect marriage. You know, with the Gothic War eventually in Italy, this, this marriage between the Goths and the Romans was destroyed, as you know. Uh, the Longobards actually brought a, a, a Germanic model that all the, the Romano Italic populations, uh, 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 except the ones that were contained under Byzantine control, actually embraced. So that all these people became culturally Germans in practice from a juridical point of view because they 
in, in a destroyed reality where you know the late antiquity had been raised to the ground literally after all the dramatic model was 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 fitting right while for example in gold it didn't undergo those destructions uh, the situation was completely different uh, and there is a perfect marriage actually between the the, the Franks, the Germans, and the Gallo-Romans, right? They remain the same elite, they share the same model, and, and they, they become a hybrid, right? That's how the Carolingians, right, just as, you know, a single dynasty, but generally speaking, their, where their background comes from. They are Germano-Gallo-Romans, in many ways. Uh, so, um, the Germans, their kings especially, convert to Aryan Christianity because they want to be recognized by the empire. It was all about that obsession of sharing the divine power of the universal empire, right? The freemen didn't give a damn because actually didn't wasn't even very happy that a king existed in the first place because kingship actually was a you know was a problem in Germanic world. The freemen didn't like it at all, but. Remember the process of certification we were talking about before. That's what is starting to pay, take place, um, and th there is conversely, in fact, this other dynamic that is the humble people did converted to Christianity in order not to trigger the nail feet lord, right? You know, if you depended on a chieftain that control your, you know, if you were a, a war band. Think about when Clovis converts to Christianity according to the, the, the myth. They think, you know. He he comes to the army to say that, and the army says, "Yeah, well, okay, we will convert to Christianity as well as you did." Why? Because of course the guy was freaking powerful, and these guys had all the interest to keep following him to create eventually the empire that the Merovingians did. Uh, and that's part of their interest. Why? But the same goes for eventually the the, the average peasant. There's still, of course, uh, nobody cared so much about, but. The, over time, a bit for conformism, a bit for you know fear, a bit of you know quiet life. Said, okay, well, yeah, I will ba be baptized. I will go to church, but that that's pretty much it. And these guys would keep going on in parallel with the you know agrarian um, cycles, r religions that they had gone on since the Bronze Age. You know, the, the, from millennia, right? That's pretty much obvious. We see it even in you know before industrialization, even a uh, up to a few generations ago, there were people who still be still believed that stuff, and those were formally Christian, faithfully, blindly faithfully Christian, right? So you see where the point that I'm trying to make here. Um, so what actually happened most of the times is that the evangelizers themselves reduced to a minimum catechism, and they tried to attenuate the contrasts, I mean, the, the, the most striking contrasts between idolatry and Catholicism, reducing uh, doctrine to the essential and not caring to render, you know, the, the whole thing accessible to the masses, right? Uh, what was the problem? Most people couldn't even read, so yeah, they could listen about the Bible, right? Um, that is, by the way, in Latin at this point, so there weren't, uh, there was a way, of course, of telling them in vernacular languages, but, uh, of course, it's a wholly different thing from studying the Bible, actually knowing what it is, if you don't, can't even speak Latin, you can, can't even read, right? So, it, it's obvious that the Bible is the principal source uh, of, 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 the, of the religion, and the liturgy it's basically its own dramatic version. So there was a lot of theatrical experimentalism in this regard. Even look at Romanesque archite architecture, right? In many ways in the Romanesque art and so on, the whole deal is to to show, like in a comic stripe, you know, on, on the walls, what, what I don't know what L is. To say, you, you can't understand what's written in here, but look at what will happen to you if you don't fly straight, right? And, um, and and that goes with all of a, also a particular vision of the world and uh, these were uh, they're called the dark ages you know that I don't like the term but 
but uh, of course they're not easy times, right? So there is all uh, even in there an anthropological vision that is proper not just of the, the clergy that in many ways are living like all the others, right? It's not that there are dramatic social differences um, more than the, the one that will exist during Gothic times, for example. Uh, so, uh, churches, of course, were built over the ruins of temples. Uh, sacred springs were dedicated to saints. Uh, there was a superimposition, since we know many Christian saints we uh, we can't see today uh, officially are actually either inventions, um, is historically speaking, or actually they stand. I think at Gaelic Ireland actually was you know so, so this namely early Christianization, at least you know the spread of the monasticism and so on. But most of the people would remain pagan for a long time, you know, where saints actually emerge from the, the, the figures of warriors, Gaelic warriors that had nothing to do with Christianity, that were buried in their dismounts that would became the place of, they were already worshipped and that over which churches would be built, and by whom? By the missionaries? Of course not, they were built by the local lords that said, you know what, if I build a temple here, you know, the thing will attract more people, this will connect me with other guys around, you know, with other churches I've heard that are rich, they're controlled by other lords that are even richer than me, I will enter into good net. This is how the thing began. Um, the, the, the word naturally certain other cultural activities, let's call it in this way, they were transformed into Christian solemnities. This naturally helped itself the persistence of ancient habits right and through them a certain pagan spirit of course it was as we were saying before the same clergy didn't actually understand much about christianity themselves and of course they shared a lot of those beliefs you see it think about there is all a beautiful literature we'll talk about this about the i don't know the, the sacralization of weapons we even made a video at some point i think how often in early medieval sources of course swords were blessed on the altars, uh, it was still believed they had mostly an apotropaic value in this sense, so that the guy was, uh, you know, the warrior that did this was namely Christian, but believed essentially that the blessing on the sword would give them superpowers in battle. What did this person know about the re redemption? Or, I mean, there, there's actually something to that as well. No, do not underestimate war psychology. There's, there are very pragmatic reasons for that, for that as well. But don't think that being a warrior is easy, or that you don't, you don't come out traumatized from from what you see on a battlefield, and that you don't need to feel the sense of uh, expiation, in a sense of uh, of atonement, right? We were making some video just recently about this, the, the topic of the penitence, and uh, it's very important. There was a suggestion, there was a an exorcism, if you want, of, of these, of this terrible, terrible feelings, that, that is needed psychologically speaking. We are the same p identical people from a biological point of view, from, from uh, those of those times. And as a consequence, morale, most of the times, was imposed through terror, rather than inspired by Christian love, right? Uh, so the marvelous also occupies so much place. Right, think about all the, the geography, you know, the destruction of the terrible monsters that lived in this, that are nothing but, you know, those animal symbols that existed and uh, connected the previous pagan reality. So you find the, the warrior saint that crushes the dragon and, uh, and frees the, 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 all, the, uh, all the peasantry. That, that's uh, most of the times the, the relic of actually a pacification from the side of a, of a Christian lord, that was someone who had decided at least to, to, to enforce Christianization, to get rid from the, uh, the countryside, from the forest, these bands of, uh, uh, of the, the comitatus of these war bands that lived in the wild, that went on raiding and pillaging. There is a, a deep connection to that. Do not, do not underestimate the military connection of this world thing, right? There is a lot of this in the geographies. There is a lot about brigands, a lot about monsters that are evidently inspired to, to human figures, right? 
early medieval geography is one of the single most beautiful, uh, you know, sources of, of anthropological sources you can imagine. Exactly because they were very close to, to that pagan mentality, much more than we realize. And that were designed exactly for people that were just taken from, uh, away from paganism, or at least as we have seen now, you know, that were just basically pagans, even though they had formally accepted Christianity. So they reason exactly in that way. So there is a lot of paganism in Christian geography by, by sheer necessity of what, you know, a geography was there for. Uh, the relics, think about the relics on other uh, objects that uh, helped, as we've seen in battle, or could uh, produce uh, magic, um, carry out magic fix, were all the problem of food, right? The, the idea that believing strongly in the saint, you know, in this dramatically mater and materially poor society, you you would have, I don't know, that that uh, you know, drop of oil that was enough to you know, to to be satisfied with just to, to survive that there are especially in the legions of foundation of monasteries plenty of this stuff the relation with animals that is very important as well the animals that were in paganism were actually seen naturally in this uh, as you know kind of almost uh, uh, let's say ecological sense you know the idea you know that in the hunting and gathering tradition also in sanitary ones there is this idea that you have to kill a certain amount of, of animals and the uh, deity of, uh, that leaves, you know, that protects those animals. And that is sometimes the, the animal itself in the forest, you, you know, should be thanked for so that you take just a part of them, but enough so that, you know, you can survive, but it also that's those animals can keep, you know, proliferating so that you, they will not get extinguished. With all this delicate balance, if you read Christian and Geography, the, these animals appear in the same way and they 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 feed uh the the saint uh through and there are a lot of sim think about the deer that was a typical christological symbol that there are all these intersections that that uh, help the saints that uh, they come from that pagan background it's, it's it's so obvious if you if you know the, the two sides um and there is also uh, naturally a, a sense of guilt, right? The, that uh, attributed normally to the population, right? So, to the, their emotional side, right? Their, uh, for example, feeling powerless in front of nature, or even to the faults of the clergy that takes the, the place of the missionaries, right? We have traces of, of of this connection. You know, we we even have people that willingly converted to Christianity that, however, weren't satisfied by the, the same clergy in some way. So, we... It's a very diversified background. And it's useless to say about the Christianization of the barbarian peoples that uh, there is as much continuity, as much uh, crassness, right? Uh, there is no univocal historiographical point you can make in this regard. If you want to isolate the continuity with the pagan world, you can easily do it. If you want to stress the fracture with appearance of Christianity, you can easily do it. Right? The important is to combine at that point the two things co together and getting the, let's say, objective side of the story. And as we were saying, the two things naturally went in parallel. Right? Societies change by themselves. Right? It doesn't need just Christianity to exist for that to happen. As we were saying before, it was either Christianity or some other Hellenistic religion. Uh, think about how much Mithraism was important. I mean, there, there's a reason pro probably why it didn't spread. It didn't have so much grip on the masses. And do not underestimate in this sense the, you know, how Chris Christianity was, was needed at some levels, right, as a message given the specific society that exists in the late antiquity in the early Middle Ages. Wherever this naturally had success, in others even if not, right? Um, we know, for example, that in every process of conciliation and uh, acculturation, we could counterpose one of contrary sign, and that to every stone cross planted over a uh, menhir, to each uh, insertion of 
the cult of a saint in a in a sacred place of older uh, faith, let's say, could be counterposed the destruction operated by a missionary of a sacred grove or a sacred spring or the overthrowing of the idols and so on. Right? There are counter uh, countless examples of this. For example, take uh, the same Christianization of Roman paganism. The insertion of the Christian Christmas over uh, the previous solstitial festivity or for example the one that the Liber Pontificalis talks about and uh, about which there are you know many doubts in some ways about the substitution of the Lupercalia with the um, candle mass right at the by, by Leo the Great. The Christianization of some agrarian cultures was undoubtedly rendered easier as it demonstrated by the scriptural and liturgical language by the exceptionally important role played in the gospel by the parabolas inspired to the life of, of, of the countryside and especially uh, that evidently already existed as such even in the you know in the Jewish context what you know of, of the, the first century had you know existed but that even in there was not dramatically diff you know separated from 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 the pagan reality and especially uh, the very peculiar space occupied in the Christian cult by two agricultural products bread and wine right the body of Christ so these were very you know certain sim symbologists were very cleverly employed in the process of Christianization but that in many ways were already belonging to the you know to human courts of Christianity right you know bread and wine are not just what I don't know what Christ liked to 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 eat to make a snack in, in the afternoon <laughs> Right, they're probably the Eucharist. So, what the the point here uh, is that there the was already a universal language that Christianity spoke, right? So the substitution of the older gods with these Christian saints provided with similar attributes that are represented at the same time as the triumphers, in a certain sense, the continuators of the same uh, of the same pagan tradition is one of the thorniest chapters in a geography right because uh, if we think for example the preservation of the cultural forms and also the uh, s proper places of cult we have plenty of examples right for example uh, um, around the rem durocortorum was a sacred tree you know the rem would become the uh, properly the, 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 the place where French kings eventually would be crowned. You know the mystics of together with Saint Denis uh, of, of the of the Capetian monarchy. But since you know Saint, Saint Remy proper had baptized Clovis, so that's how it all began, as far as uh, the, the Franks were concerned. And that's why it's such a powerful symbol, historically speaking. But we know it was a sacred tree, uh, to which was associated. Uh, a cult in a legend relative to Saint Theodulf, uh, also in in the Celtic area, this great uh, stone crosses substituted eventually the old menhirs that, and actually the 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 menhir was preserved in, in that occasions and just a cross put over it. Right in in Brittany, this would have acquired actually the symbolical value of the Calvary, right? On the Carnac tumulus uh, was built a chapel dedicated to Saint Michael Archangel. Saint Michael Archangel for the Franks, for the Longobards, but for you know, was, was naturally this most powerful warrior angel. Right, he was a typical, could be a typical ear in the, the, of the Germanic sagas, but his emphatic tradition, sword in hand, that destroys evil and becomes here the, the deep syncretic model. Right, 
um, there were enormous continuities. And, and the interesting aspect of it is that there weren't just, you know, there wasn't just one paganism, as we've seen. There were separating positions of very old, um, uh, you know, local, for example, in Mediterranean, if you, the uh, St. Michael Archangel in St. Angel Mountain in Apulia, for example, it was uh, an ancient Italic sanctuary since, uh, you know, countless time. Well, that's where the Longobards settle eventually, and, and they bring their own, you know, they're barely Christianized themselves, and they see in their Thor fundamentally. Um, and then eventually they get Christianized, they, 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 they put St. Michael in it. So think about all the superimposition of these military figures, because these were all warlike people, so you know, were another, including Christian ones. At Pluche, was a dolmen was carved from uh, you know in order to create a, a chapel dedicated to the seven saints so even inside the same sanctuary uh, we know of Eastern and Pentecost incorporating older uh, celebrations of spring and fertility right the what's the rebirth all about in this regard not to be exploited finding a, a common ground between the two traditions, and but there wasn't even properly like a moment in which someone arrived and substituted that. Like it was same communities that did that gradually. Uh, the two Saint Johns allowed uh, that certain solstitial feasts were perpetuated both in summer and in winter. There are beautiful um, studies by Kuhn, for example, or Manselli. There are a lot of uh, of interesting books we could we could suggest in this regard to read, but just for telling you, you know how mm, macroscopical this process was. How m not the, the the single missionary, but how the the various community, all the communities, were involved in this process. So this, from one side, could make us reflect, for example, of the insecurity and the um, mythological ambiguity of the apostolate that therefore couldn't uh, but help you know couldn't help but you know adapting to the single concrete situations proving itself to be consigning where this was necessary or simply you know convenient and adopting uh, instead an opposite attitude where said they couldn't do otherwise. For example, in general, however, the concessions to the older customs had to do with the exterior facts, right? Cultural habits, mostly. As we were, as we have seen, uh, that's what paganism had been about, mostly a contractual form of ritual aspect. So that was enough in many ways. In 866, for example, we know that Pope Nicholas I gave a series of responses, so of of answers properly to the consulta, so the you know the the debates that had uh, so the things had been debated were presented to the papacy by the Bulgars that had been converted by a uh, by a few time you know that at that time the the Roman Church was battling the the Bulgarians over with, with the the, the Constantinopolitan Church to, to convert them to 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 the Roman side so there was a even in their all political reason, and evidently the, the local uh, Christian Bulgars were, you know, in, interested even in just you know, what the what do we have to do exactly to to conform to this? And for example, these consulta uh, we know from the epistle of Nicholas the uh, First, there is a a whole deal of military customs that was they were connected to the Christianization of, of these people, right? So that the Bulgarians in that tree, because we can't speak of Bulgarians by this point, because the Bulgars had already been diluted somewhat in, in the Slavic reality. Um, and they were asking, you know, the Pope whether they could substitute the the military insignia of, of the um, cross to the traditional ponytail, Right, and also, uh, if they could make certain prayers and pious works 
were connected to the magical practices tending to obtain victory, right? So to the Bulgarians at that point, even it was very important, even just for, for military reasons, to, to, to get the Christian magic right, right? So in that case, you see that these people actually cared a lot about their own Christianization. It was just about the, the political aspect. There were genuinely certain material aspects of the sort that they thought they could get through to a proper perfection of their Christianism. Gregory the Great had also advised to the, the, the Anglo Saxons to transform in religious feasts their sacred banquets, right, as it happened in their in their culture. And uh, there is also some rarer case in which there were ethical social problems uh, emerging that surely, as we were saying at the beginning, were more delicate than the previous ones, but for which the Christians, however, weren't going to make dogmatic compromises. For example, the licity of the divorce. Right, divorce was even in here. It's very funny how people look at these older societies say, oh, look, there was divorce. How modern were these people? You know what that was actually? Was that someone found out there was something gone wrong uh, with the marriage. Uh, there, there were economically interesting the thing. Of course, women weren't free. They were always under the control of someone, juridically speaking. So that idea of equality of this society is of true things like divorce. It's people that have never even studied Germanic law. They don't even know what it is. Uh, but, of course, that was needed, because if divorce happened, it was, was a serious matter. That naturally, the, the society mattered for, because it was not normal to, di to divorce at all. Right? There had to be a, a pretty valid reason for it. Um, and Christianity said, no, this is a sacred marriage. And also for Christianity, of course, you know, not divorce, but as you know, the nullification of of marriage was was an option. But for certain specific reasons, were weren't always the same ethical social ones of of this that these populations knew. For example, also the abandonment of children was a usage in these societies. Uh, the use of um, horse meat, right, that dated back to sacrifical contests, uh, contexts and uh, they were therefore suspect in some ways. These were uh, usages that were far from Christian ethics and therefore could be locally allowed not much to decrease the traumatic character of conversion, rather because they were rendered necessary by serious, say, economical, climatic Therefore, survival reasons, right? What, what do you think the children were exposed actually, right? In in the in the harsh living conditions of the Icelanders, for example, in the first years of the 11th century, the new Christian faith could not ask to the local people to abandon the custom of the newborn exposure. Right, it, the Icelandic conversion was actually very fast, very smooth. But these people used to expose newborn children, right? Why do you think it would happen? Well, of course, it's horrifying. But this was needed for an economical balance. Some children had to die because it was not enough food for everybody, and just the strongest at that point were. This is, this is something we would naturally put a person to jail for a lifetime. But at that point, it was literally a matter of survival, right? It's either they died like that in, in other ways, and maybe even creating more damage to the rest of society. That's the world you would think you would, you think it was positive. It was evidently not, right? But in that specific Icelandic context, in other areas were abandoned, but in there, where survival was a serious business more than other lands, this thing couldn't be required, right? Uh, it was about dietary matter. And uh, the survival of the whole family 
and also, for example, eating horse meat, well, renouncing to that would have meant for the Icelanders to be deprived of one of the few sources of proteic substances present in the island. So that, in, that couldn't be forbidden either. So you see where the flexibility of this whole thing emerges. Like, you know, and it, it's fully coherent. This is not about a, a stupid, you know, uh, you know, prejudice. No, you don't have to do this point. There's an adaptability to it, and that's how you measure the civilization of this system. Right, so you can't even say here, yeah, there was any imposition. Even though, at least, I mean, horse meat is probably not a big deal, unless you're a vegan, but uh, the... And don't think I don't care about the, the poor horse. It's just that, you know, and but the, the children exposure, right? You know that you know at that point probably I don't know, would the Christians be right enforcing that? Well, we have to put in account what the, the what that would have been, would have produced, practically, right? So now the the problem of war, just to reconnect with the with the general background from which we, we stemmed in terms of why do we talk about when we talk about this aspect, you know, it was a very dangerous sphere. Because you understand that using violence is usually actually a countering instinctual thing. Because our big prejudice we, we try to debunk all the time is that violence is inhuman or barbaric. Right. There is some of that, of course, in everything we do, but, you know, organized violence, war specifically, but violence also, think about in this society is what using violence equated to. Like, it's not like there's a attack today that, I don't know, goes out there, uh, kills a bunch of people, and, uh, you know, nothing, you know, people would, you know, maybe goes to jail for life, but, you know, immediately, at the time, it would be someone who would find you and would exterminate your family, right? Because the German fighters, that, that's what fundamentally were. And so you would think twice before doing something stupid, albeit it was sometimes the same stupidity, apparent stupidity, let's say, that would actually make the point because the, 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 the least developed a society is and the more it's the individual. Why all this in warrior emphasis in the thing? Because we've seen it many times talking about, I don't know, Norse warfare in this century, for example, how it's obvious that the, the least resources you have, and the more you have to, to count on yourself in many ways, and not on a collective organization. But in this same tribes, of course, if things were not handled just to the individual, right? There was probably a collective responsibility as well. And it's obvious that using violence at that point, if, if, if it happened, well, was something thought, like war, as we're seeing now, is 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 counter-instinctual, right? It's something artificial humans do, right? It's not a mark of primitiveness. On the contrary, there is something very rational about it that we have to take into consideration. So, the reasons why this was happening is that more likely it was a pretty accepting political situation, that affected society as well. So Christianity had a say in this in an equally political way. That is to say, you can't make war to this other clan, uh, right? Because if you do, you will mess up the whole region, let's say. And if a clan wants to clash on another clan, likely, as we were saying, they had a reason. Just like, you know, for exposing children. That is to say, maybe they would, they would Irremi irremediably go ruined and people would die. But here Christianity backed central power by saying, no, you can't do that. You haven't under understood that. So that equated to, to, of course, to deprive these people generally of, of, of their freedom, right? Which is a very different thing from liberty, for example, um, which Christianity was trying to enforce. It is to say, absolute freedom is not a positive. Like being a warrior, wandering around and thinking that, you know, you can do whatever you want. It's not a model civilization. That's why 
properly in this century is, as we have seen many times, this model is crushed under the heel of organized warfare. Look at the Carolingians against the Saxons, just for saying what. Uh, or look at what the Vikings learned to do over time, right? It's the more the more the way that they were able to achieve is because the more they had crushed the individual strength and they had increased the collective one. Look at the organization, great army. Well, all it entailed from a logistical, disciplinarian point of view, an administrative point of view. Why do monarchies are born in those countries, carried out the stuff, right? Why was Denmark the most powerful thing? Because they were more warrior-like. The same, op the very opposite of it. They were more centralized. They were curbing violently with kicks on feet of, of, of warriors right to frame them into discipline the very harsh way which means that you know it's not that they had properly much of mean to do that but the point is that if you didn't do that you would turn into ashes and so with you your women your children your house right your kin this is how civilization is enforced just because there is the goddamn bastard that is not capable of understanding what discipline actually means and screws up the whole thing, right? This is a, the problem that civilization has continuously, right? And that's where you need someone who's mad. And, and the whole idea of monotheism with all the hierarchical and, and, and hierarchical model, in part, had some parallelism actually in Germanic society. In Germanic society, if you think about what's the god of war for real, the most powerful one, is it a tough, beefy guy like Thor that goes around, kills giants, drink beer, and all this stuff? No. It's an old man without an eye, right? Uh, like a, an itinerant. And that that's the prototype of uh, actually of the older, wiser chieftain. Then in the youth, is surely being more Thor like. But now he's more Volan like and understands something that others do not quite get because. They have seen what the thing. They have seen that from the close, right? Like Odin that hangs himself to learn the meaning of the runes, and he's able to tell this other bunch of 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 uh, hyped guys is we need your strength, but you you need also my brain, right? And civilization is brain. This was still a primitive model, right? But it, why not? And that's the same for which every society has developed from. You know, a few, uh, you know, a few thousands of years ago, we were all hunter gatherers. That's what we were. So someone began to do this. I guess where we are now. How many hunter gatherers do you know in the world? Pretty damn few, right? There is a reason for that. As much as our quality of life has rocketed to the stars, and no people do not live better in, in hunter-gatherer societies, right? That, that's something you want to take philosophically speaking, but there is no doubt about the sheer good you can do by living in the world we, we do to compare to where you are an hunter-gatherer, right? I know it's debatable, I know it's controversial, I know it's plenty of survivalists out there who think otherwise, but opinions, right? And I also have my one, then uh, live or take it. So, it's obvious that touching war, as the Clausewitzian paradigm reveals, means to, to touch the very foundation of institutions and, uh, let's say, not only political and ethical structures, probably economical uh, and, uh, in a broader sense, social structures of many peoples that only at this point actually we're knowing what the Christian world and, and as we have seen all what came with that organization only speaking was about right um, we were talking the other day about the Varangian Guard for example Varangian Guard whatever you want to call it uh, what you see just like what we were saying about the Vikings before that for example the the show Viking doesn't get it right by the slightest is that you know the Viking era was done by people who spit on 
the traditions of their own peoples. Because they went out there saying that they were better than all the freaking society, that they could make their money abroad, that they could go serve a Christian, the most Christian power, universal empire of Miklagard, making a lot of money, coming back in Scandinavia with more money than any Scandinavian had ever seen, creating a kingdom, crushing the that egali allegedly egalitarian society that existed in there, and creating a monarchy. Just imagine if, you know, a Scandinavian at the beginning of the 7th century had been told what Harald or Trade would have been by the 11th. You think he would have been proud? He would have been shocked and traumatized. And had wished, you know, nobody had ever known how to do anything like that. You see, that's where, you know, identitarists and alt writers get it wrong, right? Leftists get it wrong in our way because they think that, you know, these were just a bunch of, you know, uh, murderers by cultural vocation, and of course they weren't in that sense. But the others say, you know, ah, oh, you know, there was something to be so proud of. Those guys would have spit in your face if they had seen what, what you have become. This is the funniest aspect, though. You think you, you descend from those people so you share their values. Those people were spit on you and your whole family because you're act objectively for their standards a disgusting slob. Do we want to be even serious about it for a second? Uh, this is what people lack completely in, of, in terms of historical perspective and that's what makes me uh, kind of triggered all the time because it, it's as if, you know, you know, we know these things. You know, if just people open the damn history book for once in, your, in their lives, they just know that there is a world of references, of, you know, of sources, and not of wishful thinking about what these worlds were, as if it was a matter of opinion. Because the opinion of uninformed people actually do not matter anything, and this is the beauty of it, right? You can actually say, this is not true historically speaking, this is, right, and, and people want to reality to bend their own way are the people that will take reality as a train in their face because reality doesn't give a damn about what you think got it once again this is the beauty of it so the warlike customs let's say and the same experience of the clash were too deeply rooted let's not say in the in the consciousness, but uh, let's say, because it's not really about that, but let's say in the forms of civil coexistence in order to be eradicated without producing in these people actually a, f a frightening cultural alienation, right? Uh, as we were saying, this process is very gradual. And consider also that nor the Roman Empire nor its heir, that is the, the church, had any intention of eradicating them, as we've seen. And for one simple reason, as we have said plenty of times, Christianity is not a pacifist religion. Never be. Right? It's a specific one. It's no um uh, it's not digress. The video is already along the way it is, but you know what I mean, right? We made we explained that in the video on St. Paul and the Militia Christi, we have explained it well enough. Uh, but properly, this is the most practical point, the Church needed the same pagan values that she even was influenced by historically, in many ways, right? The Bible is not a monolith. Right, it's a historical thing. It was sedimented over centuries, right? Um, and we'll talk about that. Think about the god of, of war. God, lord of battles, right? The church, the Roman Empire alike, needed these peoples for their needs properly of military defense and of the same propagation of faith. You know, how long would it have it taken to Saxony to be Christianized if, if Charlemagne had not raised it to the ground, like, objectively? Like, this is the point, right? What did Christianity need? Did it need people that just wouldn't 
hurt anybody. We made a video about the creation of a Christian Romano-Christian consciousness with Ambrose of Milan uh, with the you know all the celebration actually the of of legitimate defense of the empire swords in hands what about Charlemagne crowned Roman Emperor by the papacy what's an emperor like a guy that wears a crown and sits on a throne the emperor, by definition, in that world is he who bears the imperium. In other ways, he's the person that will exterminate every single person that will find in front of him. Opposing Christian faith. Right? It, there is someone who has to keep order. There is no society without order. There is no society without forced military pacification. Right. For no band of thugs that co can go around with the excuse of the comitatus and the, you know, the the, the war bands and berserker stuff that can say, okay, we'll keep living as, you know, renegades out there in the woods, you know, just ravaging, raiding. Them. You can't do that, guy. And this past, right? This was learned the hard way, through. Uh, through someone sword in hand who did it in the name of Christ right? and you may think in that regard oh, what a terrible thing it, it's actually not terrible what do you do to terrorists? you caress them you blow their brains out and there is actually nothing wrong in it right? it's a sin because that's what, what it was considered also at the time nobody ever wondered uh, whether that was a sin or not it was necessary, and this is something that Christianity has always acknowledged. Judeo-Christian tradition has always realized. You have to obey the authority. There can't be any progress in civilization if there is not a stabilized political and social reality. Who can work or produce? Who gets killed in the street, right? And the interesting aspect of this, in fact, that if you look even within the same pagan world, between the Zip and the Comitatus, you can easily recognize the thing. And of course, the more, let's say, a democratic structure within the Think, for example, the, the assembly of the same warriors that were mostly farmers, etc., the, the Comitatus, the, you know, these other realities that lived at the margins of society were something different, right? At the end of the Viking era, a berserker, you know, a, an average Scandinavian peasant would know what a berserker was. Like, it was just some weird... Uh, more dear brigand lived out there in the woods you know a few centuries before it was something different in a in, in relative terms I mean the, let's put it differently that the, the average Scandinavian peasant a few centuries before would have seen it in different ways but at the end of the day it's the same thing it's just literally a thug a brigand, brigand that goes out there does weird insane stuff for reasons that can be fully motivated in terms, as we've seen, those economical regions, that it can be, that it has a place also in that morality, in that spirituality. Of course, it was a religious thing as well. But this doesn't change that there is no room for moradiers in a civilized society. And if the moradier insists, you go out there and you blow his brain out. I think it's a very pacific, yet not pacifistic statement. And this is exactly what Christianity preaches, right? And nobody says it's a, a wrong, uh, you know, it's not a wrong thing. It's a sin, again. But it's most evenly oriented for, you know, a pretty healthy uh, political direction. You don't want thugs around. This can generate abuses. This is what happened at the same time. But as we were seeing at the beginning of the video, also this went improving over time as well. So how do we cope with that? Is our state today freer because it's it's less powerful? There is no comparison with the, the power, the, the, the sheer level of centralization and, and military power of our, our states to anything that ever existed at the time. And still we live better than they did at the time. So there is a balance so that um, this is not to say that, you know, Nazi Germany or Soviet Russia were 
happy places to live in because they had centralized as hell in a satellistic tradition. Uh, but that reveals exactly what it means that you can't have a civilization without the right balance of collective violence and forcible. Right? Because otherwise you wouldn't have even a resistance to national socialism or to communism or to fascism and so on. Right? And and that is important as well. And and that balance is somewhat naturally, you know, draw. Like there are certain uh, this is kind of another digression we, we could we could spare, but let's say that you know you, you can't squeeze too much someone. You know, d never put someone against a wall, because unless you want to see how hard you can fight, right? So uh, human societies do not sit there waiting, and always be aware that whoever, whoever is at the top needs at least the majority of the people from his side. Because otherwise, there's no way to, to keep these people on. This is what the history of our societies has been as, uh, up to this point. There is no evil dictator that comes to power and, uh, you know, the people is just a poorly oppressed one. At least half of them are from their side, because otherwise the dictatorship, the totalitarianism, cannot work by definition. Right, so also, this is very important from a, from a moral point of view. For all those imbeciles who say, oh, those were just guys who were obliged to do to go to war for their country. Yes, you know, for a for a genocidal government that, you know, they could take arms against instead of going to, to kill other people. And they didn't. So obliged my eyes. They're a bunch of criminals and they most cases got what they deserved, right? Sometimes not, unfortunately. Um uh, Another aspect here is naturally uh, how can you take away, for example, arms as to, from from a person that sees it as an indispensable instrument of of life. Right. Think about gun control still today as an issue, and it's actually a very important one in my opinion. Uh, but at this time, you would consider it proper as a divine symbol. Right, you know, also in, in the tangible proof of, of political rights, like of being a chief is proper, but properly, you know, this this bearing arms established the unse um, you know un unseparable relation between being a warrior and being a freeman of your own people. So this was another issue, as as we were saying before, the aristocracy is mostly developed in that regard uh, systems that did um, even in there shift the balance in there for sure but even in there for for reasons that think about the second invasions right the the gestation of uh, properly of the European uh, seniors in that time that's an important issue it cannot be disregarded saying you know just the the most powerful guys taking over because the others were too poor. There were specific reasons why the same peasantry said, okay, you know what, we, we want to be under that signatory because we need protection from whoever came or from wherever. You didn't even need to wait for the second invasion. It's actually the, the overwhelming reason for things like encastellation and so on were the internal struggles between the same Christians, right, you know, easily, right? We know it, historically speaking, that actually the, the majority of, of fortifications built uh, during the so period of encastellation, uh, you know, because of the second invasions were abandoned rightly afterward because they were kind of episodic. You know, the majority of castles from those centers were built by noblemen, ones who controlled the territory, right, and extending their power over the population. That's another cliche of saying, you know, look at all the castles popping out because the Saracens or the Vikings arrived. Oh, Europe understood. It didn't went like that, actually. Right, and just if you studied the military history of the thing, or you know the the the, the encapsulation as a historiographical uh, topic, you 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 know that it's not like that. And we don't have to exclude the positive because you see what happens here. It's the childish attitude of screaming because someone needs to use violence. 
So you have to blame the external guy because you can't uh, even accept in, in a society that you think you should be, you know, virtuous, that violence can be used even for good. This is we, the problem we have with left and right today. Because they're both that stupid. Like, the average stops to, to, to this childish behavior. They can't even reason out in terms of, you know, maybe we need a balance between the two things and not really just one side or the other. Maybe that, fortunately, there are these two sides because they counterbalance each other, but you know, people eating their own liver in the process is not really a, a healthy thing to happen. So, how can you, in general, from a Christian standpoint, even think to ask of a total refusal of war to those that, following the prince, the Christian prince, had been chosen in the Gefolgschaft of the same, and that un unbearably connected the fact of the military enterprise uh, that actually was not very different from just raiding and looting, because that's practically how it still kept happening, right? How do you think this was enforced? Well, it's not it was a just Christian guy who arrived and said, I'm king and so powerful and good, and they, 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 they emerged from the same, uh, basically, public-less mindset. That's also another important issue that is deeply connected with this thing. These people mostly, completely lacked any sense of statelary, a public reality. Right, uh, it, it, it's actually embarrassing. Like, uh, if you wonder how the, the Carolingian Empire came to the extent it did, but also how quickly crumbled, it's exactly for this reason. There was no state to to, to, to keep the thing on. It was all private connections, nothing else. Right? You know, Charlemagne and Louis de Pius kind of tried to enforce something, but it was just basically using the church that would eventually turn into also a local lordship with their own military retinues, but there were other aspects of or the idea, you know, the, the process of Christianization was enforced by the Carolingians in, in many areas of Europe, it did help in setting the line in many areas of Europe to, to say, okay, well, you know what, this model isn't that bad after all, we have something to, to gain from this order, we have something to gain from anything being the new center, the new empire, Right, have you ever thought about that? It's very important, actually. Um, but, again, Christianity didn't properly even ask for war to stop. Also, how could you pretend, for example, that the principle of forgiveness and of the offenses could be immediately comprehended in a social system in which the blood solidarity and therefore the use of vendetta had a uh, value such extended in general, right? Uh, is our big question. For example, Bede na uh, narrates the, the, uh, the history of the Saxon king of Essex, uh, Sigbert, um, that was killed by his own warriors because they believed that accepting as uh, a Christian the idea that the enemies were to be forgiven, he had come less to the his function of magical chief of war, right? This is from the Storia Ecclesiastica Bed uh, 318. Um, so, there is, I think, too much that we have touched today in a single video, but I, I hope you realize this was framed in the um, in the in the broader relation of what could be negotiated between the Christian world and the uh, non-Christian world, let's not even call it, you know, well, okay, well, in this case, of course, uh, Islam was spreading, Judaism, of course, existed, but um, you know, more specifically in Europe, th with paganism, uh, could could be right. This ratio of strength uh, is something that concretely took place within these societies. Like, Christianity was not the outside or the inside. Th these ideas were spreading. Right, the world knew about these things. It wasn't 
a matter of uh, you know discovering it one day uh, of course they knew people knew people traveled people communicated that is probably one of the more underestimated thing this idea that everybody was ignorant they never traveled they never knew I think we would be amazed to see how much these people knew and how much these people even before seeing a priest had started toying with the idea of what the hell is Christianity let me hear it could interest me what, what's that all about and if anything for one reason there was a freaking universal empire in the center of the Mediterranean that everybody was aware of and that everybody at least in the Romano-Germanic kingdoms which was trying to imitate politically and institutionally speaking right from Visigothic Spain to Anglo-Saxon England uh, from the Carolingian to Bulgarian Empire right so it's not something that uh, you know even of course outside of the saying there was also the the the, the Slavic or the world uh, perfectly attracted by this and of course it would be attracted people want to live better lives want to have more power more wealth I mean it's natural that's what we do what's what we want all the time what do we do all this for of course it's you know reproduction ultimately you know continuing the thing over and over again but doing it the best way possible right ensuring ourselves that things will go better because we we found out pretty damn hard how this life is pretty damn short and fragile and and and, and it's as brutal as 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 it sound so that's what the natural tendencies we were talking about before. It's not about the squad of the Christians and the squad of the pagans. It's about the human squad trying to play with different skills, different capacities, and finding out new stuff and seeing what works or not. And doing also a lot of messed up stuff in the process because that's also human. But still we know, psychologically speaking, that our mind is designed to make sense out of chaos. Right, and that's properly what uh, you know. We are we are irrationally, but still with a rational consequence attracted by. And I find it very interesting personally because I read history in these terms, and we we discover every day that it's basically about this. That cultures have an enormous range of exchange. There is no thing like a wally Christian or a wally pagan society. That all cultures all share actually way more than we usually think of, and that differences are needed sometimes to polarize our attention to improve the thing and to revolve around. But there is a whole freaking load of humanity we, we can start from to to acknowledge how the the thing works in the first place. And most people, you know, we need to rationalize this to study to read, to grow with that, but in fact that's the problem, most people don't realize that. Now it would be interesting to know how the thing evolves, but uh, you know, that's not this video's point. However, I stop it here and we'll keep talking about this stuff because I think it's very interesting. A bit theoretical, I know, but the examples here are very importantly aimed at defining a, a picture because otherwise we will remain in the tribe <laughs> you know we'll not make it to make a next step, step towards civilization but for this very reason we stop here and therefore I hope that you enjoyed this video if you did please share it otherwise leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming contents and for now I thank you heartily for listening to me. I wish you a nice time and see you next time. Bye.